Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Cloud Chronicles. With me today, I've got Sandeep Channa. He is the CTO from CSI. Sandeep, hi, how are you? Hi, Jess, how are you doing? Very well, sir, very well. So, lots and lots to get through today because we've been already having quite a big conversation before we, we came on camera. I think the first thing that really caught my attention when we were talking before was about cloud repatriation. And I've, I've got a bit of a thing on this. So I'm in complete agreement with Lydia Leong from Gartner, who wrote a great piece on this that says, the cloud repatriation is not as big a thing as people say it is. And the reason why people are doing it is largely because they never really adapted their operating model to a public cloud and a cloud operating model true. What, what's your view, what's your take? So, so look, um, there's definitely some of that. I, 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 I definitely agree with that. But actually, when, when we start to see what's happening in the market, a few years ago, um, when the word cloud was mentioned, it was an all or nothing approach. And, and all our customers, we have a lot of customers in the regulated industry, um, and everyone would say, it's all or nothing, right? We're either moving or we're not moving. When I look at it now, it's very different. You're starting to see customers who have even tried for two, three years to get completely into the cloud, and they're all starting to say, actually, now we're starting to see that the cloud isn't the only place that my applications can, will live. There's some challenges, there's difficulty around security, where data resides, um, all kinds of things where they start to think, actually, I need a hybrid approach. I need a very different approach here. And look, skills are expensive. Um, costs are escalating. That everyone's under pressure. So we, we, are, we are seeing the models go back and forward several times over now. Yeah, I mean, so it's well known. I have a whole thing about costs, about you know, actually a lot of that to do is, is people adding too much fat and not, not focusing on having the lean <laughs> muscle uh, in, in their, their designs and, and the way they deploy things. But I completely agree with you about the skills challenge, right? So that, that in itself is a real problem for repatriation because you know, we're living in a world now where young developers, they don't know which end of a screwdriver is which to go and rack and stack a, a, a network room, a, a, you know, a data center, yeah. seven racks. And, you know, is there not an argument now that as people talk about private cloud, that actually those core fundamental skills are coming yeah, more and more like the dark art of networking, you know, <laughs> that, that kind of thing. There, really. there is, there is. And look, as, as time's going on, um, you are definitely seeing a, a challenge with skills, even moving between clouds. You know, people say you go to one of the big public hyperscalers, whether it's Azure or AWS, skills are interchangeable. They're not that interchangeable. There are some nuances, some differences. And we, we do see... Um, you know, there's a tendency to flip back because they've realized they've gone one way, it's not worked out, you know, they can't control costs as they thought they could, and they are starting to say, actually, certain things live better in, in say, a private cloud. Right? Yeah. So, so we are seeing movement both ways. But, but, that, yeah. but that's the case of, you know, use the correct tool correctly kind it, of it moment. Is. It is. You know, it's like the mainframes conversation. Pe people say, oh, the mainframe's going to die, it's all going to go to cloud. I said, well, hang on, what was the exact point yeah. of a mainframe when it started out? It was all about having extremely high levels of compute with extreme low levels of latency. Now, getting low levels of latency on cloud has a number of variables and factors that make it very difficult to do, right? It, it yeah. does, it does. And, and look, there's less of that as a challenge. Um, but I think people have soon realized that you know, people can easily scale up without anyone controlling any costs, without anyone seeing what happens to the finances in the back. Um, and also when people want to do something creative, when they want to have multiple DR uh, setups and things like that, then, then the costs really start to escalate. So we're starting to see, you know, as people have gone that way, they're starting to say certain things don't, don't, don't live there very well. But, you know, things have changed and yeah. they will. And I think we're in a hybrid model now that's not going to go away that easily. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to kind of run a bit of a thread through this because you know, I'm actually kind of fascinated by the evolving role of the CTO as it goes along. But yeah, yeah. So, so there's, there's, there's a real conversation here that actually the, the skills required of a CTO and the leadership now for managing a hybrid cloud scenario or even you know, an all-in cloud or a private cloud all-in scenario is very, very different now as a conversation and the, the priorities of what the CI, CTO 
should be looking at and how they cover the CIO's back yeah, and how yeah. the CIO covers the CTO's back, right? Correct. No, no, you're very right. And, and look, you know, it was either a very inward facing role and how you stabilize the internal infrastructure of, of, of an organization and how that looked and how that and where they went to and what they did. And all you're looking at the external presence now and what customers want, what you're going to sell. You know, there's a massive move uh, on both sides of the fence. So I, I find myself actually working on both sides of it. I'm working heavily with my sales team. I'm working heavily internally. Um, like you said, with my CIO, everyone's making sure everything works internally, how we want it to, and streamlining everything down, streamlining data centers, our own processes. And you see that the CTO now is sitting on both sides of the camp. Mm. Yeah. So it really moved on. So, but, so it, you know, when we talk about you know, repatriation, you know, at what point does a CTO kind of step in and say, whoa, 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 people, there is complexity, there is complexity, and then there is hyper cloud, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, I, 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 look, it, it, it's a challenging one because you are partly driven by the customer and what they want. I think the key to it is, as an organization and, and as a technical team and a technical function in an organization, you've got to be very conscious of what that customer's business needs are. You've got to understand the business. You've got to understand, actually, the customer might want to go this way, but long term, this is not going to work for them. So it's whether you can convince the customer there and say, look, actually, for, for you, public cloud might be better for this. Um, I've had a recent scenario, a big retail customer of ours, where we've had a look at their backup and DR strategy. And it, was, uh, it, was, it went the other way. Well, by the time we'd finished with it, we thought, actually, this is better in public cloud because their strategy is moving to public cloud. And we're moving them the opposite way, we, where we've had customers the other way, where we said, actually, public cloud is probably not the right space for that particular application, and we've got to move you back. So, yeah, I mean, it, this really depends on you knowing your customer, knowing what their business needs are, and what their challenges are. Well, yeah, because I mean, this, this kind of goes to the, you know, the Werner Vogel's frugal architecture yeah, point, yeah. right? You know, where cost is a non-functional requirement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and systems that last are the ones that actually have these, you know, the, the and which is why I kind of disagree with Werner Vogels. It's not just cost in mind. Actually, for me, it's the trade-off between business outcome, technology performance, governance, and by that I mean like the regular, the regulatory, the compliance, yep. sustainability, you know, all of those things, and cost, right? So it, it's a trade-off, right? It's how do you make the least worst choice? Because that, because that's what it is, right? It's it's, it's a trade-off. So I mean. How, how are you seeing that affect you and your decision making for technical roadmaps as a CTO, right? It, it, I, yeah, so, so I mean, look, we, we always go at it, let's design the solution as we think fit first. And then if something has to be traded off, that's a secondary thought for us. The original, first thing we want to do is get the solution right. Let's get the solution right. And then actually, if we have to look at how, um, whether this works or doesn't fit into things like budgets, that's a secondary conversation always. You know, the key for it is actually let's try and put the right solution in place so the customer gets what they want. And then actually, if there's things that have to ch uh, change or things that have to be tweaked, we have that conversation with the customer, right? Yeah. And you manage that through. But how do you deal with that internally? Because you know, let's be honest, oh, you're always, yeah. you're always <laughs> going to be under cost pressure, right? So, okay. so that the IT budget, you're spending, what, 75 to 85% of it just keeping the lights on. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Right? So there's very little scope for innovation. Yeah, yeah. You've got to find the efficiencies every way you can, you can do it. So that's when you start having those tough conversations around level three applications and, yep. and stuff yep. in non-production environments where we actively turn this stuff off or we put it down to minimum levels of technology performance yep. in favor of cost you know, and, and that sort of stuff. But of course, there's, there are mission critical stuff which have to be on 24-7 have to have some headroom in them because they're business critical. They are. And look, a lot of that is, so I have an, I'm, I have an automation team in the background. We're very good at automating. Um, and that really is where that challenge comes into its own. These guys are really good, um, whether it's Ansible, or Terraform scripting, all kinds of stuff to make life easier. And, and look, they work internally for the business as much as customers externally. And that's really where we gain a lot of advantage and, oh. and try and deal with that cost yeah. because they simplify things that we just didn't think were possible. Yeah, I mean, right? I, I completely agree, right? People are, you know, don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, I'm going to screw things up today. No. And they're a big stretch, right? But being able to automate and have predictable patterns of deployment yeah, yeah. By, you know, by your automation team means that those engineers 
who can develop themselves and improve their skills, but also add innovation because their time is freed up not having to doing the grunt work over and over again, we were able to deploy in predictable oh, yeah, building blocks, right? Definitely. And, and look, whether it's simple things like cert checking on firewalls, whether it's um, our finance team wanting to know what to bill customers, you know, these guys are across the business. Mm. And all that just helps us to get to, to much slicker solutions, tighter solutions for customers. And everything gets automated, everything's more streamlined. We have cost efficiencies internally, which we can pass on to customers. So it, it just works. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and, you know, yay, capitalism. We've, the organization has got to make a buck, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, you've yeah. got to run your systems as efficiently as possible. Of course. So your unit economics actually work and you can make a buck. Yeah, of course. You know, that, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. I don't think anyone should, should get upset by that as a yeah. notion. You know, yay, capitalism. But the, I think the really important point around that is the more automation that's in there, the better. But then there's the, there's the risk, which is too much automation means we actually forget what actually this thing does and how it does it. And <laughs> when big changes come along, you know, that causes complexity and difficulty. And you're inadvertently creating a technology debt problem that shouldn't really be there. You are. And, and look, it's this is making sure that your systems are all intertwi intertwined, intertwined and everyone can come in. Um, and pick things up. So, so you know, we, we use products like ServiceNow. Everything, everything's documented very, mm -hmm. very accurately. We can see where everything is, where stuff is, what kind of maintenance contracts it's under. So, so, and everything's documented to the nth degree. And I think that's the key, right? Um, even our automation teams, that you know, there are developers in there who, as long as they follow best practices, anyone can walk in and pick up and see what somebody's done. And I think if you get that bit right, um, you know, you, you'll have a good ride. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's always, it, that was always one of the things of old, wasn't it? Getting engineers yeah. and developers to actually write down yeah. what they did. Yeah, always. Yeah. It's still a problem. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But they are a lot better. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm sure ChatGPT has helped. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's funny, so we were talking about trade-offs and, and governance. And we, you, we were talking before about you know, operating in highly regulated industries and, yeah. and that sort of stuff. How are you, are you seeing changes because of the way in which regulatory factors are, are being done now. because now the regulators are catching up right they are beginning to catch up how's that affecting the way in which you're designing your solutions these days yeah and then then we can bring in the esg sustainability conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. off the back of that right <laughs> yeah so 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 look the regulated industries the good thing there is yes they are catching up um and that, that actually forces us to move ahead of them um and again, you know, our, our security practices internally are quite rigid. We've, um, you know, we always make sure we're three steps ahead. Whether something like Dora's coming out, we, you know, we, our teams are already looking at it and saying, right, we need to do this to get ahead. This is how we can add value into our customers. And th this is where public clouds actually work really well because look, that they, you know, not internal organisations don't have huge security departments all the time. And this is where going to something like a public cloud can really help because they have got the resource. And they've invested the time and the cost um, to make those environments highly secure. As long um, as you know your boundaries. As long as you know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so, so look, that, that's, that's where you know, we, we work it through. We hold a lot of accreditations internally ourselves. And that's partly because the kind of environments we do work in. So, yeah, it works really well. Yeah, so, so, so moving that into the sustainability thing. So I have a, a bit of a bee in my bonnet about net zero because when you offset carbon and you plant trees, who's actually checking the, please, the trees that were planted actually stayed alive and didn't die and were well maintained and looked after? And actually, what was the impact of those things? The, the problem around the whole you know, story of green and sustainability in tech is there's so many variables as you start going beyond you know, scope one. And when you start following that, that supply chain all the way through, that gets awful complicated, right? It does, and look, net zero in a data center world is is, is very difficult. Um, let's let's be honest. Um, I, I think you're right. The longevity of sort of um, offsetting carbon offset is very hard to monitor. But you know, there's technologies out there we could actually implement to monitor. But um, you know, it, it, it's a tricky one. I think the industry has got a lot of technologies now that streamline data centers. You know, we're going through a massive 
reorg internally, closing down a lot of data centers for that reason, because we want our footprint lowered. And, you know, um, here's one of the challenges. Um, it's, it's always better if you can go to the latest, greatest technology. Yeah. Right. Because it's more dense, it's, you know, more efficient on power. Um, you get more bang for your buck, you know, everything else. Um, but that's not always easy. So, you know, as an organization, you, you have to be constantly planning ahead. We're constantly planning to go to the latest and greatest infrastructure. So, the, you know, there's not just um, benefits to our customers in terms of performance, but we can lower our footprint. So I think organizations need to think about it all the time and plan it into their designs. So we, we you know, as I said, we're going through huge changes, uh, you know, both in our virtualized platforms, our networks and all sorts. And that's all on the back of trying to condense down our footprint. Yeah. And so, I mean, how, how much of a, of a you know, requirement are clients putting in now about being able to demonstrate? I mean, what, what's, what's the plan? I mean, as a CTO, you, you've got a massive yeah. challenge in front of you saying, as part of the service you're delivering, you are very soon, either through legislation in places like in, in Europe, yep. or indeed because of socially conscious or even you know, uh, activist investor pressure, uh, yeah, of the board being asked the question of, so what is your scope three and talk us through it? Yeah, so, so we, we have signed up to a framework. So that keeps us in check internally. So we have to adhere to it. And yes, you're right, we're getting customers asking us more and more about it. You know, can you write a bit about this in your, um, you know, in your proposals? We'd like to see, you know, what your data centers where you um, work, what, what do they do? And luckily, you know, the data centers we work in predominantly are very conscious, and they have been for years um, about their carbon footprint. Um, and, and really, it's getting that out in front of customers and saying, look, this is what we do. It's now getting embedded into our day-to-day -day working life, so we're doing it as we go along. Um, you know, even down to hybrid working and whether we need you know, huge offices and whether it's worth dragging everyone in. Um, you know, there's multiple things that we're looking at. But you know, the key one is you've got an adopter framework. Yeah, so I have a team internally who have looked at that and signed up to a framework, and that's what we base um, a lot of those ESG decisions on now. Yeah, yeah. And, but mapping the scope three stuff, right, that's, that's going to be a labour of love, right? It is, and again, you know, I, th I think we're going to wait and see how much we get pushed, <laughs> yeah. if I'm honest. No, no, it, yeah. Yeah. it's um, a massive piece of work. It, right? it is, it is huge, and, you know, organisations have to see, because at some point, like you said, the cost is going to get passed around to the customer. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and you know to the end user so I think there is a bit of that um, definitely and I think we do need to think you know how much is actually achievable yeah yeah given let's be honest let's be honest yeah yeah um, you know you can achieve so much um, and you have to be sensible like you said um, cost isn't always the conversation but it is one of the factors yeah, yeah. this is why it's trade-offs to the yeah. next one I mean it's kind of followed through as a thread the whole way through our, our conversation today, which is you know, essentially the evolving role of the CTO, right? So it is. You know, from, from what we talked about today, from planning out data centers to operating in a complex hybrid cloud or even pure public cloud environment, from the, the shifting in priorities in terms of the style and type of technology and the way in which people use it, skills paucity, other factors such as sustainability. You know, as in your experience, you know, from let's go five years ago to today, how much has the CTO's role changed? And if you were to mentor someone aspiring to be a CTO, what, what's your big line? <laughs> yeah, no, look, re really good question. And I think, look, the CTO's role has become so broad now and not just about technology you have to understand many facets of business and the environment and what's going on in society, what people want, what they don't want. It, you know, it's a, it's a huge role in itself and it, and it encompasses, you know, pretty much the whole organization end to end. You know, so daily interactions are with the whole organization. You're not going to just speak to, um, you know, technology work stream, um, uh, look at technology work streams. Um, you're going to look across the whole organization and say, look, how can we make things more efficient? How can this help customers? Customers are going to ask for new technologies that do, you know, make their life easier. There's so many things that our CTO now has to do that, you know, wasn't there five years ago. So what would you, what would be your big bit of advice oh. to one of these <laughs> CTOs? No, look, for somebody, look, I, I enjoy that challenge, right? Um, I love, you know, talking to people, you know, getting across people. Um, so that works. 
Um, but it's not just about technology anymore. Um, you have to have a, an interest in, you know, a, a huge amount of stuff outside of um, pure, you know, technical, um, you, you know, pure technical skills. You, you've got to have a lot of interest in, you know, how businesses operate. Yeah, yeah that's great. very key. Yeah. Great. Well, Sandy, thank you very much for your time. Really no, enjoyed that you. one. It's been really good fun. Thank good. you. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching the Cloud Chronicles. We'll see you again for the next one.